Climate change presents immense and growing challenges to the world around us. It demands big ideas, immediate action, and a willingness to take risks. Climate Grand Challenges is a whole of MIT effort to develop high impact climate solutions to the toughest climate problems and bring them to the world as fast as possible. With the extraordinary work of our five flagship projects, 22 finalist teams, and the whole MIT research community, we can not only change the trajectory of humankind and our planet, but inspire others to join us. Please welcome President Raphael Reif. Good morning, good morning. On behalf of everyone, everyone involved in the MIT Climate Grand Challenges program, welcome aboard. We're absolutely delighted to have you with us as we introduce our five flagship projects to the world. I'm grateful to the many people who helped create this showcase event, including our outstanding panelists, as well as all the MIT researchers who invested such inspiring creativity and care in developing the solutions we will hear about today. I also offer a warm hello to the congressional staff members joining us today, and a special, a very special shout out to our distinguished guest, Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry. In July, 2020, when we launched the Climate Grand Challenges, we wanted to focus the daring creativity and pioneering expertise of the MIT community on the urgent problem of climate change. But the world was still reeling from the first months of COVID. MIT researchers were just getting used to working on campus again. 
We simply did not know what reaction to expect. So you can imagine how thrilled we were when our first call for proposals yielded nearly 100 submissions involving almost 400 faculty researchers representing all five MIT schools as well as our College of Computing. After rigorous review, we invited 27 teams to develop comprehensive plans. And from that exceptional group of finalists, we then chose five teams to proceed as flagship projects. And you will have the opportunity to meet each one of them today. These projects touch domains from industry to agriculture and from prediction to adaptation. Yet they all aim to address an important unsolved problem in climate. And they all aim to generate and deploy significant solutions at scale in time to make a difference. Together, these flagship projects will define a transformative new research agenda at MIT, one that has the potential to make meaningful contributions to the global climate response. Each one has received a vital boost of initial funding from MIT. Yet with aspirations on this scale, these projects will also need allies and supporters at MIT and other institutions, as well as from outside the academy, including investors, philanthropists, policymakers, industry leaders, and more. To all of you here with us, and to all of you watching, I hope that what you hear today will inspire you to join us in action for humanity around the globe. Climate change has been called a super wicked problem. In Boston, that might sound like a local way of saying really hard. <laughs> but this phrase is actually a technical term. It describes any enormously complex societal problem that has no single right answer and no clear finish line, as well as multiple stakeholders with conflicting priorities and no central authority empowered to solve it. A vivid example is the current war in Ukraine. It's obviously creating terrible immediate human suffering. It is also affecting the price of oil and gas, and therefore impacting the global debate over climate and energy policy. Complexity, uncertainty, and conflict can paralyze progress. In fact, I recently heard a phrase that has stuck in my mind. When it comes to addressing climate change, despair is as bad as denial. At MIT, we believe that when a problem feels overwhelming, the best antidote is practical action. And that is exactly what we're here to share with you today. So let's get started. The program begins with a fireside chat between me and our special guest, Secretary Kerry. It is a chat, but luckily for me, I will be asking all the questions. <laughs> In January 2021, former Secretary of State John Kerry became the first person appointed to serve a special presidential envoy for climate. Secretary Kerry is an inspiring choice. And his role is a perfect expression of the fact that when it comes to climate, no nation can go it alone. And we're all in this together. So with that, please welcome Special Presidential Envoy, John Kerry. Secretary Kerry, it's a great honor to have you with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Since, since last May, MIT has been pursuing its latest climate action plan, and we call it Fast Forward. 
because we believe that progress on climate change depends on pursuing two tracks at the same time. Track one is do everything possible, as fast as possible, to get current technologies deployed and policies implemented. Track two is to accelerate the development of new technologies and policy tools, because current technology alone, we believe, is not sufficient to meet the world's climate goals. So two questions. Do you believe we need action on both those tracks? And do the world leaders you meet with share that view? Well, first of all, thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to tackle this wicked, awesome problem <laughs> with all of you. Um, I'm really thrilled to be at MIT, and I congratulate you, uh, Rafael, on, an, on a very timely, critical um, initiative, which is, as I said earlier, classic MIT, and I think it's a part of what we're going to need to get where we need to go. Those two tracks are, are absolutely uh, correct and critical. We do have the technology we need now to do what we need to do between now and 2030. But we don't have the technology we need to guarantee we can get to net zero by 2050 and do what we have to do after that. I mean, even if we get to net zero by 2050, if you want an awesome problem, uh, we have to take 1.9 trillion or so tons of CO2 out of the atmosphere and figure out what we're going to do with it and where we put it. That's, that's once we get to the net zero. Um, we can do that if, if we were to deploy much more of the renewables that we have and keep some of the nuclear that we have already providing uh, and bring online some of the clean energy sources that we've been building in the last years, we can get a 45% to 50% reduction in emissions between now and 2030. But that requires also for the rest of the world to be doing things at a pace that they are not. In Glasgow, we agreed, and it was quite extraordinary actually, we got um, big countries, China, Russia, India, others, to consent to a kind of shift from Paris, where in Paris we agreed we had to do two degrees or well below two degrees with an aspiration of trying to do 1.5. Because of the IPCC report of 2018, we all know that uh, no longer is two degrees, that doesn't cut it, or well below. And by the way, well below two? Sounds like 1.5 to me. Uh, so, um, we're now all agreed that we need to try to get there, but it's a verbal, rhetorical agreement at this moment in time, and I'm deeply concerned about where we are. 65% of global GDP left Glasgow committed to real plans that can achieve the limiting of 1.5 degrees as your temperature increase. In fact, Fatih Birol and the IEA did modeling on all the promises and pledges made in Glasgow, and they determined that by 2050, indeed, if they're all implemented, we would be at 1.8 degrees. And when I heard that, I said, wow, you know, we really can win this fight, because if we can get to 1.8 degrees with only 65% of GDP, think of what happens if we get the rest of these people on board. So our goal now is to push for that. We are pushing for it. We're working, you know, hand in hand with Indonesia. We're working very closely with South Africa. We've got about eight and a half billion dollars we're putting into South Africa to bail out their energy uh, company, which is basically bankrupt, and uh, to begin to close down coal-fired power plants. We're working with Mexico very closely now to get President AMLO to Lopez Obrador to agree to deploy many renewables. So if we can do those things, the problem is, uh, I tell you, I mean, I've been at this for a long time, and, and I'm, I'm beginning to be a little frustrated and exasperated with people who are defending the status quo and who are standing in the way. Uh, China is 30 percent, 28 to 30 percent of all the emissions of the world. And we can't get there without China moving. Now, we created a working group with China. We had 
dozens of working sessions with the Chinese negotiating. We finally broke through in Glasgow. We got the Chinese to agree that they will this year issue a, an ambitious national action plan on methane reduction. They will join with us in the working group in order to try to reduce our, uh, their, their consumption of coal and they will deal with deforestation. So if we can get them to move on those three things, we could get enough of a reduction curve to get to the 2030 date in a, in a, in a decent place. And the IPCC recently said, in its most recent report, mm -hmm. that while the window is closing, we actually do still have time to be able to do what we need to do to avoid the worst consequences. The worst consequences, not to avoid the crisis altogether. So. Um, each of the tracks you've talked about, so, sort of, you know, taking the existing technology and deploying it more rapidly. But the IEA also tells us that to achieve our goals more rapidly means deploying renewable energy five times faster than we are now. It means deploying, you know, cutting coal fired power five times faster than we are now. It means getting electric cars on the road 22 times faster than we are. And you start hearing those figures and say, we have to mobilize as if we're at war. And in many ways we are, because part of what's happening in Ukraine is tied to the weaponization of energy, and it's a problem. So um, at the same time, we must push the new technologies. I was just out in, uh, in California per, just to really learn more about what is happening and what is real and how can we get there. And um, at Google X, I saw people making carbon into product. And there are real ways we can do that. I know in Australia, they've done some of that, other places. Um, in, uh, uh, with a bunch of startups, uh, I saw things that will change the game on lithium and how we produce it. Battery, battery storage, 100-hour battery, game changing. So we have to push those technologies to market faster. We've got to find them, check their, their, their feasibility, put a demonstration together, prototype, get out there, and then bring them to scale. That's a monumental job, folks, and it's all got to be done in the next eight years. So I don't think we're equipping ourselves sufficiently to actually meet that target, which I'm concerned about, chagrined about. Um, and we have a very, very difficult political situation in our country today where an entire party uh, has decided that the concept of climate response is toxic. And they will not acknowledge the reality and move on it. So if we don't move on that, then the United States of America, which has the historic high of carbon production, uh, is going to become a real problem in terms of uh, where we have to get to. Mr. Secretary, you, say, you said um, if we can get to work together, and you mentioned other nations, uh, we have a shot at getting there. And, and there is a lot of things frustrating going on in the world and sometimes in America as well. But let me just say that we are with you. And there is, if there is one person that can accomplish that globally, that's you. Wow. Well, <laughs> okay. In other words. Thank you, folks. It was great to be here. Um, Thank you. Uh, Look, it's really hard when you can't talk to some of these people. Um, I actually got a lot done with President Putin when I was there. We got chemical weapons out of Syria. We did the Iran nuclear agreement. We did the Paris agreement. We created the largest marine protected area in the world, the Ross Sea in Antarctica. So we got some things done. But this is a very different moment and a very different person right now. And we, you know, Russia's off the table for the time being, so that's a problem. Uh, China, we have many other issues with China that are getting in the way. Uh, obviously, climate is not a bilateral issue. It's a universal, multilateral, uh, global challenge. To some degree, we've been able to separate that in our meetings, but recently I have begun to feel uh, a growing tension which I worry about greatly because, the, I mean, we can't, you know, you can't talk in the context of existential challenges 
and then walk away the way people are walking away and behave the way they're behaving. Either it's existential or it isn't, and it is existential. Why? Not because the ideology tells us that, because the science tells us that. This is a matter of physics and mathematics, not a matter of politics or of ideology. But unfortunately, we are stuck in a place where ideology is getting in the way, uh, where the polarization of our nation is preventing us from doing what we know we have to do. Uh, and uh, history is going to judge us very harshly if we do not uh, find a way through this thicket at this moment. All understood, those are serious challenges. Uh, all I meant to say is just keep at it, don't give up, we need you. <laughs> you don't have to, it's okay, I accept the responsibility. <laughs> Thank you. I accept the nomination. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Mr. Secretary, the Grand Challenge projects uh, we'll hear about today deal with many aspects of the climate change problem, mitigation, adaptation, prediction. On climate adaptation, what do you see as the greatest niche worldwide in that arena? On prediction, how helpful would it be for countries to have more precise information on where and when climate impacts will be felt. And in mitigation, uh, a project focused on industrial energy use and on agriculture. What are the biggest hurdles in your view to making progress in those areas right now? So I'm talking about adaptation, prediction, mitigation. Well, the biggest problem, Rafael, the biggest problem is the status quo. <laughs> powerful vested interests that are standing in the way. It's just the biggest problem. I, I spoke at CIRA, the big energy conference in Houston this year, and I was the lead speaker, the, the beginning speaker, the first speaker. Um, and what was supposed to be a meeting that was truly organized around transition became a meeting that suddenly reorganized itself around production. And you could just feel the energy industry feeling excited by the prospect of what was happening with supply and demand. The demand obviously up because COVID was beginning to seem like there was a, some light somewhere. So demand was going up and also supply was going down because of OPEC. I think that's had far more impact than Ukraine per se. <laughs> um, but uh, the price is high, drives the politics and uh, instills fear in a lot of people, particularly, you know, six months out from a midterm election. So again, the politics are getting in the way of, of and, and truth. We have lost our ability in the United States of America to agree on what facts are and what the truth is. And if you can't agree on what the truth is in a democracy, you have a real problem. And that's where we are. Uh, and it defies imagination because there aren't sufficient facts to support the alternative views. I mean, there aren't alternative facts, right? <laughs> uh, as old John Adams said, you know, facts are stubborn things, but we are not behaving that way. So um, I don't mean to sound, I, you know, I'm more and more persuaded, frankly. Uh, first of all, government doesn't have the money to do what we need to do. When I stopped being Secretary of State, I left the job believing that it's going to be the private sector that solves this for us, and I still believe that. The marketplace is going to be far more powerful in solving this than the government, any government. And we need to deploy trillions of dollars in order to do this. Uh, you know, the UN finance report says that um, we have a deficit of about two and a half to four and a half trillion dollars per year for the next 30 years just to get to net zero. And um, the reality is that, that um, you know, we've had trouble getting 100 billion for the 100 billion that was promised in Paris for the less developed countries to help them transition. Now we're about 96 billion now, but even if you get to the 100 this year, we will be at 100 next year. But even if you get to that, that's not, that's, that's you know, a drop of water in the bucket compared to what we need. Now, in Glasgow, we did create a, a, an alliance of major investors in the world, asset managers, asset owners, banks, etc. 
I personally went to Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, uh, State Street. And those banks, the six biggest banks in America, committed that over the next eight years, they will invest in this transition $4.2 trillion. And, uh, and, and that's without BlackRock and others who say they'll do a trillion by themselves and so on. So you can get to six, seven, eight, ten trillion dollars pretty quickly. The problem is deploying that money. It's investment money. It's not concessionary funding. So you need to find a way to de-risk some of it. And we're meeting on that right now this week. We will have meetings with uh, various, the, the multilateral banks are, are meeting in, in, in Washington, uh, World Bank, Asia Development Bank, European Development Bank, et cetera. So we're going to try to find a way to create blended finance and activate that money. And that money rushing into the sector will, I think, have a profound impact. In addition, um, we do have $62 billion that went to the Department of Energy, and I am still hopeful that we will get some kind of climate bill out of Congress. Uh, you know, there are discussions taking place right now, and there's a possibility of it, not a certainty, but a possibility. But those trillions of dollars are key. Also, there's about a trillion dollars of venture capital now in the marketplace. Uh, and and in, investors are waking up. ESG has changed boardroom discussions around the world. And people are now sensing much greater urgency to uh, finding the solutions, the, the, the new technologies, and taking to scale some of the old technologies. So, uh, you know, what keeps exciting me, the reason I keep at it, is we can do this. We can win this battle, actually. But there has to be a massive change of behavior and a shift in the allocation of capital. I think the marketplace has a better chance of enticing that shift than does the government, absent perhaps one tool the government could put in place quickly, that would be the investment tax credits and the production tax credits. Those would make a huge difference. And if at some point people could bring themselves to price carbon adequately, that would also have the greatest impact, as your own modeling at MIT shows and everywhere else. That's the biggest shift you get in the curve. Uh, comes from pricing. Yeah, the legislation to move us in that direction no, faster? No, none on that yet. No, I mean, there are people pushing it. Senator Whitehouse from Rhode Island, uh, uh, a few other people. Lindsey Graham's talked about perhaps uh, doing something in that vein. There, there's certainly a bipartisan small group who could move on it. But it has not yet been proposed and adopted and, 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 and and uh, promulgated as a major initiative either by the administration or uh, the Congress at this point. So it's being talked about, but you don't see anything coming anytime soon? Probably not on that, certainly not six months before an election. <laughs> That's true. You, you, you touched that topic, uh, the, the, the markets and, and the private sector, and I think indeed waiting for government action uh, is sometimes maybe a little slow for the time scales we're dealing with. So the next question is addressing a little bit of that, uh, and I'm curious about your view there. Is Because one problem that we have in the US right now is that we don't seem to move technology rapidly enough mm -hmm. from the lab to the marketplace. And I, I, I'm seeing Katie Ray, who's in the front row. Uh, she's been fighting that fight for years now, leading the engine. Uh, and in fact, that's the subject of today's final panel. So what strategies would help make the US a leader again in moving technology into commercial use. Um, and have you seen any successes at home or abroad that you, you may want to share? Well, putting vast, I mean, serious money into consortia that you, I mean, if we were to bring people together, universities, colleges, laboratories, we, the 17 labs are actually doing some really interesting things. Uh, and there's a lot of money going into the labs right now. And, and I think that has the potential of changing it. But we, you know, we need about five Manhattan projects, frankly. That's what I think, anyway. And I think that uh, we ought to organize that. And that's how you know, America's technology lead will be kept by facilitating the breakthroughs that are necessary in the technologies we know we need here. We, tried, we, we started something in Glasgow, which I find actually uh, promising as one of the tools to try to excite 
different activity. And it's called the First Movers Coalition. We got 36 companies. We're now, uh, we're setting a goal of trying to get it over 50 by the World Economic Forum, which will take place in May in, mm -hmm. in Switzerland. And our goal is to bring these companies to the table. And what we're trying to do is have the, the first movers are big companies that are helping to accelerate the creation of a market. And they do it by paying some of the green premium up front in order to create a product that the marketplace needs and wants. For instance, on aviation, we have Boeing, Delta, United, Salesforce, and Apple that all agreed that 5% of the fuel, the air, airline fuel that they use for flying around the world for their businesses is going to be sustainable aviation fuel with an 85% reduction in emissions. Now, we don't have that tech today, but by saying we'll buy it, mm -hmm. somebody's going to go out and say, okay, there's a ready market, we're going to try to make it. Lafarge Wholesome, which we raised mm -hmm. in a conversation earlier, is making green cement. They're paying the additional premium, and people are paying and 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 uh, people are buying it. Ironically, they're buying it not because it's green, but because it's a better cement. So there's been a b benefit to that project. Um, Volvo agreed that 10% of the steel they buy to make their automobiles is going to be green steel. There is a company in Sweden making green steel. So that could accelerate the move of people if we get more people participating in that. Um, uh, Maersk, the largest container shipper in the world, agreed that the next eight ships they build will be carbon free. So, you know, w it's exciting to have companies stepping up and saying, we're going to take the lead, we're going to help create this market. I think we could accelerate that significantly, and obviously if you had a you know, tax credit for that kind of behavior, we would see a huge shift in, in, the, in the marketplace. So yeah, there are things that are happening that I think are exciting. The problem is it's not happening fast enough. And, and, and that's where government comes in. Government can send the signals. Government can create the structure. And you can build around that and move much faster. Uh, and I hope yet we will still get there with a, a climate bill this year which is essential, by the way, for American leadership. It, 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 we just will not have credibility in, in the global marketplace of ideas and actions uh, as a climate leader, and we have been leading. I mean, we put the methane pledge together. We now have a pledge that 112 countries, 113 now, we just got Qatar to sign up. We have 113 countries have pledged that they will join in the pledge to reduce global methane by 30% by 2030. If we achieve that goal, and personally, I think we can exceed it, because methane reduction is sort of plumbing. It's not reliant on high-end technology. It's plugging leaks, leaks in the pipes, leaks in the wells, leaks at the wellhead, leaks in transportation, leaks in use, uh, flaring, all these things. So if we curb all of that, it's the equivalent of getting every automobile in the world, every truck in the world, every ship in the world, every airplane in the world to zero by 2030. Big impact. It's a saving of 0.2 degrees Celsius on the rise of the Earth's temperature. So, I, you know, those are the kinds of things that give you encouragement. It can be done. We have to organize the effort, and, and that's what we did with the Methane Pledge. Senator Curry, you, you said a few moments ago a, a climate bill. Can you, what do you see coming there? What, 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 what's your crystal ball? I, I, nobody has a crystal ball on this one. Uh, maybe Joe Manchin. You said that. Joe Manchin has up. a crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this requires, this is one person, uh, you know, that's got to decide what they're willing to put on the table. And um, I, he's thinking about it. I know I had great conversations with him at the IEA meeting. I talked to him just the other day. I know he's thinking about how to do it, and he wants bipartisanship to try to come together. So we'll see what happens. But I, I think a bill in the range of $500 billion for climate activities of various kinds would really be a shot in the arm and put us on the track we need to get on. Let's talk about business leaders. We have only a few more minutes. Uh, you talk not just to nation leaders, you talk to business leaders. 
what are they saying, business leaders, about climate? What, do they understand how significant and dangerous the changes to the world's climate are? And uh, how would you assess their commitment to a rapid transition? I think there are a lot of business leaders of very important companies, uh, some of which I named, uh, you know, the Microsofts and Googles and, and uh, uh, you know, Apples and others who are trendsetters in many ways, and a lot of other companies, you know, Ford and, and GM. Ford and GM are completely retooling their factory floors. They are going to produce electric cars. The target is 2035. Only electric cars will be sold in the United States, and they're buying into that. The utilities are buying into electricity's role in this transition. They're not fighting it. So there are people really raring and ready to go in the, in the private sector who are, and, and many, many companies are now stepping up. Look, and you witnessed what I said about the banks. They're ready to invest in the sector. They're allocating a specific sum of money to that sector. But they also need certain ingredients to be aligned for them to make a responsible fiduciary decision to put the money on the line for longer term investment. But look, we had about 13 to 17 trillion dollars sitting in a parked status paying net negative interest over the last five years, uh, which is absurd when there are many projects around that are transportation projects, energy projects, water projects, that have revenue streams. So you could clearly set up a capacity for that money to be working for you and maybe a 7% return, 12%, it's not 100x. But it's a decent return, particularly for people with fiduciary responsibility like retirement funds, you know, pensions, scalpers, others who have to look at a longer term with a different standard. Disclosure, by the way, which the SEC is now proffering, is a huge factor because that disclosure is going to require companies to assess the impact of climate on an investment going out into the future. And if you're investing in real estate in Florida or, you know, Bangladesh or other places, it's going to be pretty clear you're going to have a different view of that if you're looking at taking climate into effect. So I think the corporate world, not, not writ large yet, but increasingly larger, much broader sector of people are deeply concerned about this because they know it's going to affect business, values, supply chains, returns, and, and that's where I say the marketplace is going to move here, and already is moving. Some people ask me frequently, especially abroad, what happens if uh, you have a return of a certain president, or what happens if, uh, you know, there's a shift of parties and you have the people who are denying still taking over. I believe no politician can turn the clock back on what is happening now. I think the marketplace has seized this. When you have a trillion dollars of venture capital moving towards battery storage or green hydrogen or electrolyzers or carbon capture or utilization of some kind, there is money to be made in that. And the people who understand the science know this is not a fake issue. This is going to get worse and it's coming at us. Every economic analysis done that is legitimately peer reviewed and published shows us it is far, far more expensive to not respond than it is to encourage these investments and to do the things we need to do to build resilience and adapt and so forth. It is going to happen, in my judgment. And one of the reasons is good old capitalism. People are going to see that they can make money doing this and the marketplace is going to move. That should make it work. Secretary Kerry, it's a great honor for us to have you with us this morning. Uh, thank you for this fascinating conversation. As you can tell, I think I speak on behalf of all of us in this room and for all of us watching us, that we're proud of the work you do and they're proud of staying and standing with you and standing with you in this extremely important work. Thank well, you thank so you, very my friend. much. I, thank you to MIT. This, this effort is what we need. We need grand challenges around the world. We need to come together in these efforts. So this is a brilliant uh, initiative and, and very important leadership. And thank you, MIT. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> let me just say, we're, we're, now, we're now going to hear the, the flagship teams and the flagship projects. But before, we're going to just watch a brief video 
narrated by somebody with a very familiar accent. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Okay. I have to go to Washington. I, I hate it, but I'll go to Washington. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay. Solving tough problems is what MIT does. It is in our DNA. And today, for much of the world's population, there is no greater problem than climate change. We launched our first ever Climate Grand Challenges competition with one overarching goal, to marshal the expertise and resources of the entire MIT community to pursue the big ideas it will take to address difficult unanswered questions facing humankind and its only planet. Our faculty responded with nearly 100 bold proposals. From this outstanding pool, we invited 27 teams with the most promising concepts to the final round. Now we're proud to announce that five finalists will become flagship MIT projects. Together, these projects are launching a new agenda of transformative research with the potential to catalyze game-changing advances in the global climate response. Yet Min Chiang and Bill Gildis aim to reinvent and electrify the processes and materials behind hard to decarbonize industries, such as those that produce steel, cement, ammonia, and ethylene. Raffaele Ferrari and Noel Solin are leveraging advances in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and data sciences to improve the accuracy of climate models and to make them more useful to communities and other stakeholders. Christopher Voigt is looking to revolutionize the agricultural sector with climate resilient crops and fertilizers that eliminate greenhouse gas emissions. Kerry Emanuel, Miho Mazario, and Paul O'Gorman are building a scalable toolkit to help vulnerable communities adapt to climate events and transition to low carbon energy in the face of changing extreme weather. John Aldrich and El Fatih El Tahir are rethinking how communities adapt to climate change by developing a cutting edge forecasting system to help underserved populations anticipate future climate impacts. The goal is grand and simple, to bring these new solutions to the world quickly. To help the team solve these grand challenges as fast as possible, MIT is dedicating significant funding and we're seeking more. We're eager to partner with industry, business, philanthropic, and community leaders to implement these solutions at scale and to inspire others to join us in this work. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we're here to talk about a, uh, a global problem, but I wanted to start with something very local. Uh, so you know, everyone in this room uh, probably remembers when they first came to uh, accept that the reality of climate change and the impact it was going to have. And so I wanted to t tell you, you know, my uh, personal uh, story here. So it didn't happen in the lab. It didn't happen while reading scientific papers. You know, here in Massachusetts, if you like the outdoors, you're likely to be gravitated you know, towards Cape Cod. Right? And so there are a lot of things to do out there, but what I like to do is to go fishing. Right? Now, the most prized native species in Massachusetts is the striped bass. And this is a you know, family friend, Camille Riley, and she caught this you know, you know, in the 1990s. She's now a biomedical engineer working in New York City. Now, as scientists, of course, you know, we kept data. And what we saw was that year by year, we would catch more of these warm water species. Right? This is uh, my son, Merrill, with a Spanish mackerel. Right? And at first, we thought, this is great. You know, these are beautiful fish. They happen to actually you know, be good to eat as well. But within about 15 years, my daughter, Miki, caught a tropical fish off of Cape Cod. This is a trigger fish. So my point is that this fish does not belong in New England. Right? And this wasn't the only one. We were catching mahi-mahi late in the summer. 
And of course, you know, nobody knows this uh, more than the New England lobstermen, and they've seen the sweet spot for lobster you know, moving north with a surprising velocity. And so this was how you know, I personally uh, first came to you know, understand uh, the impact of uh, a warming ocean many years ago. Right? So to save the uh, natural world, of course, we are here to uh, address the industrialized world in this particular project. Right? And so um, the topic that we've addressed uh, in our center, which is called the Center for Electrification, one key word, and decarbonization of industry. Right? We're choosing to address the first, uh, firstly the four largest emitters. Right? So cement happens to be the material that we make in the largest volume of any man-made material today. And some four billion tons a year. Right? And so along with steel, those literally form you know, the backbone of our you know, built environment, you know, our cars, our appliances. Uh, and then there's ethylene, which is the basis for many plastics, including the, you know, the packaging plastics. You'll no doubt have, you make some use of at lunch today. Right? And then you know, ammonia, uh, which is uh, used in fertilizer. Right. So just these four taken together represent some 45% of our industrial emissions uh, globally today. If you now uh, project that to uh, all human emissions, this is about 15% of all human emissions today. Right. So this is really, uh, this is a, a grand challenge. What we're going to try to do is try to reinvent uh, the processes by which uh, these have been made. Uh, all of which are 100 years or so, uh, uh, or, or close to that uh, old. Uh, and we're going to try to do it with electricity. Right? So let me tell you a little bit uh, about cement. So cement, the process we use today, was invented uh, over 150 years ago. It's a high temperature process. The temperature of a cement kiln is about 1450 centigrade. Right? And so the emissions that come from this, there's an easy number to remember. Each ton of cement that we produce emits one ton of CO2 by this process. So 4 billion tons of cement a year is what we produce globally. Half of that CO2 comes from the limestone, which we decompose on the way to making the cement. The other half comes from the fossil fuels, uh, which we use to reach those temperatures, mostly coal, uh, some old tires thrown in there, right? mostly coal. Right? And so if you instead use electricity, you can take the same starting materials, limestone here on the right, and take it and turn it into lime, which is the input into making that cement. Right? And in the process, electrochemically, what we can do is to take out that CO2 in a cold, pure form that's much easier to capture and to sequester. Right? And we can do this entirely at room temperature. And as a result, we take out the thermal emissions as well. Now, Secretary Kerry referred to some uh, uh, ongoing work with, with green cement, and there's, some, there's a path to partial de uh, decarbonization of the industry. We're aiming for complete decarbonization of the industry, and to do so with zero green premium. And we think that there are pathways to getting there. And so if you take this uh, decarbonized lime, uh, which is highly reactive, you can then, at room temperature, with an entirely room temperature process, make decarbonized cement which you see as you know, Tim De Beaver on the right-hand side here. Uh, that's not the only thing we did with this cement. Now, I've been carrying Tim De Beaver around for several months, so he's a pretty strong beaver, right? <laughs> OK, but this is a, a cement that's already you know, more than 80% decarbonized, made, as I said, entirely at room temperature. Right? So this illustrates uh, one of, you know, a pathway that we're following. Now, I don't have a lot of time to talk about steel today, but I did, did want to say that steel, electrochemistry applied to steel, can likewise achieve massive decarbonization. And that's an industry that's been using fossil fuels since literally you know, the Iron Age. Right? So at this point, let me uh, pass it over to uh, Bill Gay, who will tell you about ethylene and ammonia. Thank you, ethylene. <laughs> yeah, so let's go to the story of ammonia and ethylene. So these are the two topmost CO2 emitting chemicals by far among industrial chemicals. And the quantity is large, right? Ammonia feeds the world and ethylene is precursor to plastics. The current chemical processes that we use to synthesize them require large amounts of thermal energy input. For example, the Haber-Bosch process for ammonia and steam cracking of naphtha for ethylene. 
And the thermal energy needed, required for these processes at present is being provided by burning fossil fuels. Moreover, some of the feedstock that's needed for the conversion process, for example, hydrogen needed for ammonia synthesis, is being made by CO2 emitting processes at present. So this together amounts to a large CO2 footprint, of about 1.5 to 3 tons of CO2 emitted per ton of ammonia or ethylene produced. So I will repeat the same message as Yet Ming, that in the center our vision is to use clean electricity to decarbonize the manufacturing of these chemicals and to make them more modular and economical. And by use of electricity, we don't mean only to use electricity to convert electrical energy to thermal energy to provide to the same chemical process, but rather use electricity to break and make and remake chemical bonds, and we call this electrochemistry. And our aim is to reinvent these processes by leveraging electrochemistry as an effective means to decarbonize the manufacturing of ammonia, ethylene, similar to the story of cement and steel that Yetming has shared. And electrochemistry gives us a key advantage and leverage, in fact, a very strong driving force to drive these reactions at more moderate, milder conditions, in particular, much reduced temperatures, which makes the process more manageable with also increased selectivity towards the chemical products that we are targeting to produce. And for example, we can use solid oxide, solid state electrochemistry to produce ammonia from water vapor and nitrogen, or to produce ethylene through similar solid state routes from methane or CO2 plus water vapor. And the resulting solid state electrochemical systems are more modular, more compact, more distributable and flexible, and certainly cleaner than the current thermochemical processes. In addressing the decarbonization of these four industrial pillars, steel, cement, ethylene, and ammonia, we will consider their integration, that is connecting input and output streams among multiple processes, so that we can enable a self-contained supply chain to the extent feasible. And this integration approach can minimize the waste and emission footprint from the process overall by utilizing waste stream from one process as feedstock to the other. For example, hydrogen, which would become a byproduct of electrochemical ethylene synthesis, could be used to extract iron from iron ore without CO2 emissions or the CO2 generated from limestone conversion reaction in cement production could be used as a feedstock to electrochemical ethylene synthesis. So considering these processes collectively and looking for the best integration paths would be important for the optimum sustainability of the process. And our work will leverage targeted fundamental science to advance these technologies in our laboratories, working together with our students and young scientists, followed up by scale up from small scale to pilot scale demonstration also at MIT, and finally, and in fact, as soon as possible, translation to the field through startups or through collaborations with established industry. And I would say that we feel very lucky to be at MIT to address this climate grant challenge because we can bring together the needed key expertise all the way from atoms to enterprise under the same roof. And indeed, our team brings together the needed expertise in innovations in electrochemistry, innovations in materials, innovations in process design and scale up, as well as in the integration, sustainability and techno-economic analysis so that we can together discover and deliver novel materials, processes to enable the electrification and decarbonization of important industrial products. And we are very excited to be working on this together. And I would also like to thank the MIT leadership 
for initiating the Climate Grant Challenge activities on campus and for supporting our work. And we are looking forward to growing our collaborations with all interested groups. And thank you for being here and for listening. Starting in the 60s here at MIT, scientists have developed sophisticated numerical models to predict the evolution of clouds, storms, and ocean currents. You can see that today's weather model, here on the right, look very similar to reality. That's a picture from a satellite, um, a NASA satellite, and allow us to predict the future evolution of currents and clouds. These models have been very successful. Oops. These models have been very successful in predicting the evolution of weather a few days to a week in advance. It is now common to check a weather forecast on a smartphone and make decisions based on that forecast, like plan an event, go on a hike. This is information that everybody can use to make decisions without being an expert in weather forecasting. Similar models are used to study the evolution of climate on longer timescales from decades to centuries. To run such on, for such long time scales, climate models ignore many details, like the day-to-day -day weather patterns that you've seen in the previous picture, because of limits in present-day computer power. As a result, they are not very accurate at making projections of future climates. On the screen here, uh, you see a cartoon showing the increase in mean Earth temperature predicted by what would be four state-of-the-art climate models. All these models agree uh, with each other and with observations over the past century because they've been tuned to reproduce available observations. But this approach does not work when they try to predict the future and we see the discrepancy as we move forward. In essence, climate models are good at interpolation but not at extrapolation. These models are not quite fit for the purpose of evaluating different mitigation and adaptation strategies, which is the big theme of today's discussion. The challenge we want to tackle in our proposal is therefore to tackle two issues. The first one is to make climate models more accurate, but then also to make them useful for stakeholders, much like the weather applications that I've shown you before that we use in weather forecasting. So how do we plan to achieve the goal? Well, in particular, we'll talk about the first goal and I'll pass it to Noel for the second one, making them useful for stakeholders. So this is work that we've already started doing as part of the Climate Modeling Alliance. That's a collaboration project between MIT, Caltech, and JPL, sponsored by Schmidt Futures, to write a new generation climate model. What do I mean by that? Well, you can see a sketch of what would be our model on the left. Uh, the atmosphere, land, and ocean are divided in big blocks of about 100 kilometers by the side, that's a quarter of the size of Massachusetts, and tens to hundreds of meters in the vertical. Many processes like clouds and ocean turbulence literally fall through the cracks of the model, and figuring out how to represent the effect of these small-scale processes on future climate is the key challenge, really, of climate modeling from a physics perspective. Taking advantage of new and faster computing architectures like GPUs, we can now simulate clouds, storm, vortices separately in each one of the blocks in which we divided our global uh, model and essentially create digital data on how these processes will change in a future climate. So we are creating the digital data that we need. Then leveraging advances in data science and machine learning, you can we can then use this digital data to train the climate model on both the present past and in particular future climates. This will both improve the accuracy of the climate model, but as importantly, will also provide quantified uncertainty in climate projections that are needed to have actionable information. This new climate model can provide information that represents a substantial advance over the state of the art, not only in incorporating the latest science and computational techniques, but also it's tied to questions of global importance. But is it really a more useful model? And why should those be who, may, who are making decisions about mitigating and adapting to climate change trust its insights? Can a model like this provide the real-time information that stakeholders need? 
to address a changed climate? And will those stakeholders have the ability to explore scenarios, change its assumptions, and customize it to their needs? Our project builds on the understanding that if this new modeling approach is going to be useful and relevant to decision makers and communities, they need tailored products, not a one-size-fits-all one size simulation. And the users need to be full partners in developing and testing this model. So how do we plan on, plan on bridging this gap? The new advances in data science and artificial intelligence that help create the new climate model can also be leveraged to help us design and build new fast-running simulations that stakeholders can interact with. These smaller, more efficient simulations, which we call emulators of the full model, will provide high-fidelity predictions for the climate variables that users need the most. Right now, creating this kind of emulator is very time-consuming and very expensive. But our plan is to harness the latest computational techniques to make this process faster, easier, and cheaper. For example, a tailored emulator could be useful for local communities and governments who are grappling with issues such as heat waves and their health impacts. We know that heat waves are deadly and they're increasing in frequency and severity as a result of changing climate. But it matters where and how they occur and how long. And heat waves also interact with other human influence drivers such as emissions that affect air quality. Decision makers that want to manage the human impact of heat waves need information at the scale that matters to them so that they can intervene by planning policies and strategies for sectors like infrastructure, transportation, and energy. And those in turn can feed back to affect outcomes such as people's health. So doing so requires projections of things like temperature and other climate variables such as rainfall, and also their expected probabilities in the future. And our emulator approach aims to make that type of information necessary for those decisions more accessible and more relevant, and ideally, eventually, as easy to access as that weather app. And to create these emulators together with stakeholders, we plan to work together with colleagues at MIT who have deep connections to the decision makers who are affected by climate change, uh, both in the public sector, including policymakers and planners, as well as the private sector, in particular working together with the MIT Climate and Sustainability Consortium. And our project aims to provide the proof of concept for this new modeling approach in a few selected case studies. But once it's scaled up, we hope it will democratize access to climate information providing new information for those across the world who are making decisions that affect our shared future. So the goal of making climate information accessible and useful for stakeholders is truly a grand challenge, but one that MIT is uniquely positioned to meet thanks to our expertise in all the relevant disciplines. And that goes from climate science to be the models to machine learning and the skill to design uh, fast emulators, and finally the engagement on the right with stakeholders working both the public and private sector through numerous MIT-led initiatives. And we're really thankful to MIT and the broader work community giving us the opportunity to work on this problem probably and hopefully making a difference. when I was an undergraduate, I had the privilege of meeting Norman Borlaug, who came to my college to lecture and meet with students studying biology. Dr. Borlaug was a leader of the Green Revolution of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And he developed, in his work in Mexico, high-yielding dwarf varieties of wheat, which were planted in Mexico, India, and Pakistan. Combined with fertilizer usage and um, new farming methods, these high-yielding varieties are estimated to have averted famine for a billion people and propelled many others out of poverty. Dr. Borlaug won the Nobel Peace Prize for this work in 1970 and many other prestigious awards throughout his career. But what struck me in his conversation with us students is that he was not content. He was incredibly concerned for the future and he was unsatisfied with the pre present state of research in agricultural technology. He exhorted us that young people must continue to pursue research in this area. This conversation was one of the inspirations for me to become a plant biologist and ultimately a faculty member here at MIT. 
Today, we face far more dire prospects than when I met Dr. Borlaug in the late 1990s, and another global agricultural revolution is needed. Agriculture both contributes to and is impacted by climate change. I'm part of a team led by Chris Voigt in biological engineering to revolutionize agriculture with low emissions and resilient crops. Our interdisciplinary team, shown here, consists of members from across engineering, science, and economics with a shared goal of mitigating and adapting to climate change through solutions from agricultural biotechnology. We're addressing two substantial challenges that I'll tell you about today. Agriculture is responsible for an astonishing 26% of global greenhouse gas emissions. We're focused on one aspect of this, fertilizer, which we just heard a bit about. The addition of nitrogen fertilizer to soils has been absolutely critical for huge gains in crop, productivities, pr crop productivity. But it's come at a cost. Ammonia, as we heard, uh, is made via the Haber-Bosch process in large centralized chemical factories like the one shown here. This process consumes 5% of the world's natural gas production. Additionally, nitrogen fertilizer is heavy, which further contributes to transportation costs and fertilizer inequities around the world. Our goal is used to use synthetic biology, chemical and biological engineering, and material science to create economically viable and environmentally conscious fertilizers. This includes using genetic engineering to modify soil bacteria to provide fixed atmospheric nitrogen to crop plants, reducing or eliminating the need for applied nitrogen. An early iteration of this work is shown here, where the field treated on the right with engineered bacteria that fix nitrogen, uh, you can see looks much healthier and less yellow than the untreated part of the field on the left. And that yellowing is, is a signature of, of nitrogen deficiency. Ultimately, we seek to provide equitability and access to these new green fertilizers. The second challenge that our team is addressing is the impact of climate stress on crop yields. Stress includes things like flooding, heat waves, uh, increased pathogens, high winds, and drought. At present, about a third of the variability in crop yields is tied to climate variability. And this effect, of course, is only going to increase. So it's really incumbent on us to develop strategies to mitigate the effects of climate change on food security. To do this, we're creating climate resilient crops. We're performing fundamental research, first to understand how plants respond to stress conditions, and we'll use advanced engineering technologies to promote resiliency. Even relatively simple solutions can have a big impact. For example, as shown here, um, so these beans, uh, the seeds on the right, were coated with bacteria encased in a silk-based biopolymer. And you can see that um, even though these soils are very poor, uh, the, the seeds that were treated with this bacteria actually end up producing beans, whereas those that were not do not. Okay. So the climate resiliency, we, uh, resiliency approaches that we're developing um, will be transferable across species and ultimately will expand the diversity of food sources uh, that we rely on. Agriculture is the basis of human civilization. MIT is not historically known as a leader in the ag research space, but we are a leader in many other disciplines that are crucial for facing the climate crisis, from synthetic biology to economics. Thus, it's critical, critical that we bring all the tools and approaches that we have here at MIT, along with our brilliant students and scientists, to address these two grand challenges. Like Dr. Borlaug, we cannot be content with the current state of research or solutions for climate change and agriculture. We have to continue to innovate and rapidly deploy the solutions we develop. And most importantly, we must inspire young scientists here at MIT and around the world to pursue research in this area. Doing so will both ensure food security and the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you.
Um, my name is Paul Gorman. I'm going to tell you about our grand challenge about addressing uh, weather and climate extremes. So I think many of us know that the worst impacts of climate change are not going to be felt through mean temperature over the year or mean rainfall, but rather in very, very rare events, uh, such as Hurricane Harvey in 2017, which hit Texas uh, and had a really record-breaking rainfall, or just last year, this incredible uh, heat wave in Western North America, the Northwest of the US and Canada, which had many fatalities and huge disruptions. So these are the kind of events that have really big impact and they only happen in a given location every 100 years, every 200 years, so they're extremely rare. Unfortunately, progress, we are adapting to these uh, events, but progress, I would say, is quite slow. And also, um, the, it's tended to be in the places with the most resources already. And something you mightn't appreciate is that these kind of events also have a huge impact on our energy system. Our energy, energy system is rapidly evolving, it's decarbonizing, but it's very vulnerable in all aspects to uh, weather and climate extremes. So not addressing this problem of this really rare events uh, means we're not prepared for what's, what's coming to us. And our aim in this grand challenge is to empower communities to effectively address the problem of changing uh, weather and climate extremes. So how do we know the extremes are changing? Well, scientists have collected data uh, over the historical record, and I'm showing some results here for, for the US. And this is showing how rainfall is intensified. But what you'll see is that, in fact, it has changed very differently in different regions. In fact, the Northeast is a hotspot of, of changing rainfall extremes, which you may have noticed if you live here. Um, uh, but the historical record, unfortunately, is too short for us to really understand this pattern. Why is there such a big increase here in the Northeast versus much smaller changes in the West? Uh, but the pattern is still extremely important if we want to address these climate extremes. So to deal with that, um, we need to turn to computer models uh, for risk modeling. But this is very challenging because the events that have the biggest impact only are happening every 100 or 200 years. So we have to run our simulations a long time. But when they occur, we have to resolve them very well. And so that's a double whammy of real cost and expense. And the best approaches now are currently very limited or are not being used for risk assessments worldwide, um, or they're using statistical uh, frameworks that may not work well in the warmest climates, or in a warmer climate, sorry. So what we'd like to do then in our first goal for this grand challenge is to really make a big improvement in our ability to model the risk of the rarest events. And this will be based uh, st strongly in the physics of the problem, but also leveraging uh, advances in machine learning. And we'll build on work we've already done uh, here at MIT, or started here at MIT. For example, these synthetic hurricane tracks at the top, uh, which are uh, made using a physical model uh, and can be uh, samples at very long return period, 100-year storm, 200-year storm, or at the bottom, the use of uh, neural networks to better model squall lines, which can produce uh, strong flash floods that have, have really big impacts. So this is a really important first step, but obviously we have to translate the kind of data these models can produce and into insights and information that can be used for designing infrastructure and for communities. So I'm gonna to turn to my co-leaders. Electric power systems are one component of um, infrastructure that is vulnerable to extreme weather. So what I'm showing here are the nighttime lights in New Orleans before and after Hurricane Ida. And this image demonstrates visually the extent of the power outages experienced by residents in New Orleans after this particular event. But outages across the US are worsening, um, both in frequency and in their severity measured as uh, the duration of the largest outages. This is estimated to cost hundreds of billions of dollars to businesses, um, but more importantly, it is causing human suffering. One of the reasons why that suffering is um, greater is that the impacts are disproportionately concentrated on certain areas and communities. So the second goal of our project is to understand how the electric power system 
can be made more resilient today and in the future. And to do that, we're going to model energy infrastructure and also assess, assess risks and strategies uh, for mitigating those risks. Um, preventing power system failures means making all components of the power system more robust to extreme weather. And depending on the particular weather event, failure can occur in different parts of the system. There are many components of the system. We can see this here with the two examples of the Texas 2021 winter storm and um, Hurricane Maria and the impacts um, on Puerto Rico and other locations. Um, so depending on um, the type of extreme weather, you have risks to different parts of the infrastructure. We need to understand that. Um, we need to also understand how the extreme weather is changing. That's part of what Paul touched on. Uh, so we have to be able to anticipate the changing nature of these extreme events in order to make the system more robust. But it's not only the weather that's changing. As we look forward to um, hopefully decarbonizing and rapidly decarbonizing energy systems, as the system evolves toward this carbon-free future, which is really important for mitigating climate change, what we'll see is that the components of the system itself, the infrastructure itself, are going to change. And so we need to consider not only how weather events are changing, but also how the very system that we're trying to make resilient is changing. We need to think about, uh, because of this, new types of uh, extreme uh, events and weather events, such as, for example, certain events that could cause spikes in energy demand as we electrify energy services further, uh, transportation, industry, and so forth. And we also need to think about how um, things like um, you know, solar, wind, hydropower could be subject to risks from more extended uh, fluctuations, rare fluctuations. Um, we know that a carbon-free energy system can be much more resilient than the energy system that we have today. It can provide pollution-free, highly reliable power to consumers. But in order to achieve that, we have to be deliberate in our design of it. And in this project, we're hoping to contribute research insights to support that to support deliberate and effective decision making. One of the things that is exciting about our approach, I think, is that we're going to be focusing on the science of extreme weather and engineering societal solutions to decarbonization um, in one integrated project. What does this mean? Well, this means that we may identify extreme weather events that we might otherwise have overlooked, where we knew, need new science to understand them. And we're also going to be able to identify risks uh, to infrastructure that can inform the design of our decarbonized uh, energy system. And it is critical that the risk assessments and methods to improve lifeline infrastructure systems resilience reach the people impacted by intensifying hurricanes, flash floods, and heat waves to inform their decision-making processes. Adaptation and preparedness efforts require deep-rooted collaborations. Based on our existing partnerships, we will initially be working with pilot cities selected for their physical and social vulnerability to ex increasing extreme weather events. Cities such as Boston, Massachusetts, Toa Baja, Puerto Rico, Broward County, Florida, and Cape Town, South Africa, all face very different issues. And cities are formed by diverse communities operating through a range of power dynamics and embedded histories. And adaptation strategies are costly with complex regulatory overlays especially in federal, state, and local funding structures, policies, and plans. Currently, only those who have the time and resources can navigate these procedures. As you can see on the slide, we in the Urban Risk Lab develop technology and design strategies to align otherwise top-down processes to engage with and foster bottom-up collaboration. In our third step, working with emergency officers, city planners, 
real estate developers, local organizations, and residents, we will create more accessible and equitable ways to prepare for extreme weather events. It is our role to listen and learn while sharing new data, developing new tools that allow for co-creation of solutions. Our wonderful team, I wish they could all be up here with us, from earth sciences, engineering, energy systems, architecture, landscape planning and design will tackle mitigation, preparedness, and adaptation strategies. We see this project not only making clear and direct impact in the pilot cities, but through educational modules, interactive platforms, open source tools, technology, innovative designs and strategies, we aim to create toolkits to share with all cities, empowering communities to collectively make the best decisions with the most accurate projections of future extreme weather events. We're really grateful to MIT for this opportunity and look forward to working with many of you. Climate Resilience and Early Warning System Network is nothing short of reinventing how we do adaptation to climate change, especially in vulnerable communities in Asia and Africa and elsewhere. The levels of emissions that have been emitted in the last century, and especially in the three, last three decades, the degree of mess that we made out of this planet, suggests that some level of climate change has already been committed. So irrespective of how much mitigation is done in the coming years and decades, some committed climate change is going to happen. And that would require that some level of adaptation we have to be prepared for doing. That committed climate change will manifest itself in impacts that range, impacts and hazards that range from intensifying cyclones to rising sea levels, deadly heat waves, and severe droughts. For vulnerable communities around the world, these impacts and these hazards translate directly into significant risks. Intensifying cyclones would mean risk to infrastructure risk to habitability of coastal environments, risk to health and heat stress, and risk to food security. Despite all these significant risks, the state of the art in how adaptation is done, especially in vulnerable communities around the world, is not satisfactory. You see that in this example that I pulled from Bangladesh. This is a house that had been destroyed by a recent cyclone near the coast of Bangladesh. And these gentlemen over there are rebuilding the same house in the same location with the same material and the same design. We think that kind of reactor reaction to climate change is not enough. We propose to take proactive approaches in adapting to climate change. And what I mean by that is we could use some of the latest technology on how we can model the characteristics of future cyclones so that when houses are rebuilt, they are built informed by that new information we have about how much destructive power the future cyclones are going to have. Similarly, similarly, when you look at how adaptation is done, it's mostly dependent or pro from on projections that are coming from global climate models that have relatively coarse resolution of about 100 kilometer. So if you are trying to adapt in the southern coast of Bangladesh or in the valley of the Ganges, using GCMs would not be sufficient. You need to have higher resolution models. You need to use what we call regional climate models. And fortunately, here at MIT, we have been working on developing this technology for years now. 
and it has been tested, refined, applied in different regions of the world, and we think that we are ready to share it with communities in vulnerable countries around the world. So, if climate change adaptation is the problem, we have our solution, our proposed solution is CruiseNet. We aim to develop a framework, an integrated framework architecture that combines the latest technology on forecasting together with modern decision support systems, linking that to implementation partners on the ground that could really help screen, test, evaluate interventions before we could deploy them and improve climate change adaptation in those countries. So I would pass to my colleague Deb here to share with you some of the other unique aspects of CruiseNet. Thank you, Fatih. It is just such a pleasure and an honor to be here with you today. I'm Deb Campbell, and I'm a senior research scientist at MIT Lincoln Laboratory in the Humanitarian Assistance and Disaster Relief Systems Group. As part of the CruiseNet team, Lincoln Laboratory is an integrator across the team of the different project components, and we are working on building dis uh, information sharing and decision support tools that link MIT science products and proactive adaptation techniques with local decision makers in climate vulnerable communities. We have extensive experience developing these types of capabilities and systems, including the United States' current hurricane early warning evacuation system that's used by more than 10,000 users today, as well as a platform for information sharing and collaboration for responding to humanitarian crises in use today in several Balkan nations. MIT has never before assembled its climate modeling socioeconomic impact forecasting, and technological capabilities in a unified science to decision framework, and combined that with the socioeconomic expertise that we have on our team, including the Joint Program for Science and Policy of Global Change, the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab, JPAL, and BRAC. We are working together toward a revolution in climate change adaptation. Our work is initially focused in Bangladesh with an eye to East Africa. Bangladesh is at the epicenter of climate hazards with rising seas, salinity intrusion, intensified tropical cyclones, river flooding, riverbank erosion, heat waves and erratic rainfall. East Africa is another most vulnerable region with acute risks to water and food security. People living in climate vulnerable regions who are making decisions about climate change need to understand what will likely happen where they live and what kinds of decisions they're going to need to make to protect the people that they're responsible for protecting. Making decisions about climate change is very challenging. It requires information about the future climate tailored to the user and a deep level of trust. That's why it's critical to have a powerful partner like BRAC. BRAC is a world-renowned humanitarian and social development organization. It was founded at nearly the same time Bangladesh became a nation, and it just celebrated in the last month its 50th anniversary, and it has been ranked the number one NGO in the world for six years in a row. BRAC is a ready-to-go intervention partner they have a climate change program, and they've been uh, helping people adapt to climate change, but they recognize the critical importance of proactive adaptation, and they want to incorporate that into their programming. The local communities that they work with are resilient and creative, but need help connecting with local climate information and programs that they otherwise would not have access to. Working together, we envision communities building homes designed to withstand destructive winds of future storms, using water storage systems designed to harvest and safely store clean water when it's more abundant for resilience to more severe and frequent droughts, and adopting agricultural practices and crops that are more resilient to the future climate. In Bangladesh, Brock will pilot new approaches to adaptation, 
in their programs, and JPAL will help evaluate the effectiveness of these programs focused on optimizing BRAC program implementation, uptake, and impacts. The growing climate crisis requires a new, proactive adaptation approach to climate resilience. With our MIT team and our partnership with BRAC, we are uniquely positioned to help address the gap between the scientific and technical experts and families and local governments. Together, we are working toward a locally driven global public good that empowers communities to better plan for and adapt to climate change and improve their climate resilience. We are initially focused in Bangladesh with an eye to East Africa, and we are talking with partners on the ground now in East Africa, and we are working toward a globally extensible capability that will continue to incorporate modeling and intervention innovations over time as new innovations uh, come to light and, and we uh, can assess best practices. So I want to thank you so much for your support and your attention today, and uh, we can't wait to share with you the results of our work as we move forward. Thank you so much. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Maria Zuber, the Vice President for Research, and um, it's fantastic to see uh, you here this morning. So I hope you are all as excited about these projects as I am. In my job, I see many promising research efforts, but let me say here, uh, these Climate Grand Challenge flagships are uncommon in their imagination and their aspiration. And this was by design. MIT called on its faculty to identify the most difficult and significant climate problems and to propose novel solutions that, if achieved, would represent substantial progress towards halting future climate change and adapting to the effects of the changes that are already underway. In addition to these five flagships, there are nearly two dozen other Climate Grand Challenge finalists. Each of them focuses on using data and science to tackle challenges in one or more of the four areas that you've heard about this morning. Forecasting climate-related risks, decarbonizing complex industries and processes, removing, managing, and storing greenhouse gases, and building equity and fairness into climate solutions. Together, these projects are emblematic of an all of MIT effort that grows our mission to advance knowledge in service to the nation and the world. However, for all of the excitement, we come together this morning not to celebrate, but to commit. We are embarking on five adventures, but we don't know yet, cannot know yet, where these projects will take us. They are powerful and promising ideas but each one will require focused effort, creative and interdisciplinary teamwork, and sustained commitment and support if they are to become part of the climate and energy revolution that the world urgently needs. This work begins today. Of course, no single institution is gonna solve the climate change question by itself. We will only succeed together with the efforts of other research universities and laboratories, the investments of philanthropists and financiers, the innovations and co of companies, the decisions and actions of governments, and the determination of people all around the world. The task before us, in fact, requires an all of humanity effort. Furthermore, achieving breakthroughs in science, technology, and policy while necessary will not be sufficient. It often takes decades after a new idea is proven for it to find its way into general use, and we simply don't have that kind of time. New solutions and methods need to be widely adopted. Supply chains need to be reconstructed. Laws, policies, and practices need to be modified, and all of this has to happen globally and at warp speed. This is why MIT named our Climate Action Plan, Fast Forward, 
because humanity has no other choice. Transforming the world's economic and energy systems by the middle of this century while minimizing the suffering and losses from the climate changes that have already been set in motion are daunting tasks. But some of us remember a president who challenged us to go to the moon in just a decade. Our minds and hands and hearts are powerful tools, and I'm confident that we are up to this grand challenge. I will now turn the floor over to Alicia Barton, the CEO of First Light Power and board chair of Greentown Labs. Alicia is a clean energy leader with years of experience in both public and private sectors, including her time as CEO of the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Alicia will moderate our next panel, which is called From Innovation to Impact at Scale, Solutions in Time to Make a Difference. Alicia, thanks for being here um, and leading this discussion. <laughs> Thank you, Vice President Suber, for that very kind introduction. And uh, I just have to say, I'm incredibly honored to be part of this event today. Uh, those presentations we just watched were fantastically inspiring. I can't imagine a, a better way to celebrate Earth Week and to really think about uh, the power of the innovation coming out of the MIT Grand Challenges. I'm also very happy to have a very easy job today, which is to moderate a discussion um, from a, uh, a superstar panel of experts who are all working on how do we take that innovation and then deliver climate solutions at scale. So I'd like to invite the panelists to please join me on stage and then we'll go through some brief introductions and get right to the conversation. Great. All right. So. So this really is uh, an amazing panel of experts, and they all have incredibly impressive bios, which unfortunately I'm going to do a disservice to by uh, by shortening quite a bit and just just give the the highlights um, as we go down the row here. So to my to my right is Jack Little. Jack is the CEO and co-founder of MathWorks, the developers of MATLAB and Simulink software. Next to Jack is Katie Ray, and Katie serves as the CEO and managing partner of The Engine, a venture capital fund built by MIT that invests in early stage companies solving the world's biggest problems through the convergence of breakthrough science, engineering, and leadership. Next to Katie is uh, Manish Bapna, who is the president and CEO of uh, the Natural Resources Defense Council, or NRDC as most of us know it, and the former executive vice president and managing director of the World Resources Institute. And last but not least, Arthi Prabhakar, who is the co-founder and CEO of Actuate and the former director of the Defense, Ad uh, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which is a mouthful, most of us know it as DARPA. So uh, welcome everyone to this stage and, and uh, let's just jump right to the heart of the conversation. We just had uh, five incredibly powerful presentations on innovations that um, again have truly the potential to deliver huge impact but there's a long pathway between innovation to getting solutions at scale and each of your organizations are attacking just that problem. So. Tell us a little bit about um, how you and your teams are approaching that very lofty challenge of taking us from idea to impact at scale. And I, maybe we'll start with uh, Arthi on the end and, and come back this way. Hi, everyone. It's really great to be here to celebrate the launch of these uh, really terrific projects. Um, I, with a couple of colleagues, I founded a nonprofit called Actuate a couple of years ago. Our uh, focus in climate, our specific work, is innovation and experimentation that's aimed at getting to climate scale faster. And let me say what I mean by climate scale, because a lot of the conversation we, we tend to have in the innovation community is about how to scale up from zero. How do you get things out of the lab? How do you get things commercialized? How do you hit a billion dollars in revenue? How do you have a liquidity event so you can keep all of that going? And so many people here are engaged in those pieces. That has to happen, and we fortunately have gotten much better at how to do that for the challenges of climate. Climate scale, though, is something that's very different, and that is the scale of deployment that actually, that the climate notices, where, where climate outcomes start changing. And if, if that's your focus, as it is for us, 
Um, you know, you, you, how do you do that? Well, first of all, I think it's, it's important to think about climate scale. If you want to think about the kinds of innovations that can accelerate getting to climate scale, the question you need to ask is, what will it take? And that is very much a broad systems question because there's no one technology or one idea or one policy. There's no one thing that will get us to climate scale. And I think it's actually very instructive to see what we can learn from the, from the technologies that have started achieving a scale of deployment that the climate is noticing. And of course, we're, we're very far from fully decarbonizing any sector. But if you look at energy efficiency and if you look at renewables, these are some of our biggest advances where, in fact, we are starting to see very, very meaningful contributions to, to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And when you ask the question, well, what did it take to start to get to the place that we now have significant traction and significant deployment, in all of those cases, uh, the technologies had to come along and they had to go through all the valleys of death that we talk about in terms of technology innovation. But innovation happened in some very other areas, in very, very different areas as well. The, to pull those technologies forward into deployment, we had to innovate with policies, some of which worked and some of which didn't. We had to innovate with new finance models. and Some of those worked and some of them didn't. We had to innovate with new lines of business for established companies, new business models, new startups, some of which worked and some of which didn't. And communities had to innovate. They had to find new ways to adopt these technologies. And ultimately, of course, it was all of us as individuals and as a society that, that, that said, we have to do something different and drove policy and finance and the markets forward. So when you start asking this question about what would it take, it really leads you to some very different forms of innovation, and this is the focus of the work that we're doing. The questions we're asking today are questions about what would it take to get to 80 or 90 percent of electricity generation coming from renewable and carbon-free sources? Or what would it take to get to 80 or 90 percent of passenger transportation being electric vehicles that are fully decarbonized? Or what would it take for the very nascent markets in carbon removal to be able to scale uh, and to draw the kind of financial capital it's going to take to both advance and then deploy those technologies. And I, I think of this as innovation and innovation. 15 years ago, we didn't really know how to innovate in the early stages of R&D or in new technologies for climate. We didn't know how to do venture capital and get this ball rolling. We now know how to do that, and some of the people who are here are right in the middle of that. Now I think we've also got to add a form of innovation that's about getting to massive scale, the kind of scale that the climate notices. That's what we're all about. Manish? Great. Uh, really a privilege to be here with all of you today. If, if climate is uh, truly a wicked problem, I, I think we heard five absolutely wicked solutions. I mean, this was really bold and inspiring. Uh, so uh, I'm with the Natural Resources Defense Council. We, we, we kind of major on policy issues. Um, technology is absolutely critical to getting to scale. So is finance, but so is policy. If you take a look at where we are state of play in the United States, made a commitment 50 to 52% below 2005 levels by 2030, we're at 17% in 2021. Right, far off track. If you look globally, Secretary Kerry said we were at 1.8, 1.9 degrees. That, that is a very lenient definition around what countries have committed to. If you look at things where there's been actually some real policy in place, we're at 2.7 degrees and we're not on track, far from 1.5. So we need to be thinking about how we get impact at the scale that Arthi's talking about. And in the short run, policies could be a critical piece of that. My organization, NRDC, has been working for over 50 years uh, on many of these issues. We've worked a lot on, for example, vehicle emission standards. How do you actually drive down emissions of vehicles? Worked in California in 2004 to get the first advanced clean cars rule. Worked hard to replicate that in a number of other states. Worked with the Obama administration to get the first real federal standards for greenhouse gas emissions from vehicles for up to model year 2025. Now the question is, how do we get to 100% zero emission vehicles by 2035? That's what we need to do. And we're working in California again, trying to do that, and really trying to push hard at the federal level to see how we can make that happen through that strategy. 
We work a lot on renewable portfolio standards. Power sector, absolutely critical to decarbonization. If we're gonna get the industrial decarbonization that we heard about today, has to come from clean energy. 1983, we were in Iowa working on the first renewable portfolio standard. 38 states in the District of Columbia now have RPSs in place, 12 of them, 100% clean energy by 2050 or earlier, but not yet a federal standard. How do we get that in play? We're working in India. I was in India about a week and a half ago, first trip in two, two and a half years since the pandemic. Hottest march in recorded history in India. We were working, uh, some of you may recall, really terrible heat wave in 2010. Um, tens of thousands of people died all across India. Uh, uh, Ahmedabad was in particularly hard hit. We started working in 2013 with the Indian Institute of Public Health, the city metropolitan council of the city, Ahmedabad, uh, to put in place an urban heat action plan, talking about early warning systems. How do you get coordinated response for essential services when heat strikes cities? How do you actually build capacity of the public health system to respond effectively? Did a really good job at that city, worked hard about how do you actually then replicate that in now we're in 20, 23 states, over 100 cities across the country in no small part by working through the federal National Management Disaster Agency. Three kind of quick ingredients about what kind of get policy at scale. How do you quantify and make much more visible the economic and public health benefits of the interventions we're talking about? Resonate, connect with what people care about today in addition to the climate benefits. Think about unlikely partnerships. We worked with the United Auto Workers in California to get them to be from opposing tough standards to being friendly towards stronger vehicle emission standards. And how do you think about kind of variable geometry, you know, thinking where the political windows are. Sometimes you can move things in Washington, sometimes you have to work at states. How do you be nimble about creating those constellations where you can begin to push and create the scale of change we need to see? So critically important set of issues. Uh, I'm a graduate, 1991, 6-1, uh, uh, was not a very good engineer. So my actual bachelor's thesis was with Bill Siebert, who passed away a few years ago, and it was on undergrad engineering reform. How do we get engineering curriculums to better address social environmental issues? What I did back in 91, so this is so, such a delight uh, to be here with all of you today. All right, thanks so much. I'm Katie Ray, I run The Engine, which is, uh, we, we actually are five years old, uh, about a month ago, and we were spun out of MIT. Uh, I'm looking at Anantha, our Dean of Engineering, who was integral to this, as well as President Reif. But there was a bunch of thinking done, maybe t 10 years ago, about what was happening in what we think of as tough tech, and climate tech is tough tech. These are wicked hard problems that often are, you know, tougher to get to market because they're capital intensive, and and systems problems, um, and large systems problems often. But MIT doesn't sit on its hands ever, and so there there were a group of people that said how could we use the community that we have here to reinvent how we finance these tough tech companies? And so the engine was really born out of that with a really terrific group of people. Um, and so the last five years, we've raised three funds and backed 40 companies, many of them in climate technology. Uh, and many of them in the most difficult areas where innovation was central to their founding. And MIT is a leader in this globally, uh, and that is in the invention of these technologies. So we do things like fusion power, so Commonwealth Fusion, which I'm particularly excited about and I'm gonna talk a little bit about. But we also look at the decarbonization of every industry. So MIT has companies that are doing cement, steel, uh, decarbonization of pulp and paper, dairy. This, these are not just starting today. This has been happening for a long time at MIT. But now we have a moment to commercialize these projects that I think is an extraordinary moment. 
I consider myself one of the luckiest people in the world because the students coming out of MIT, and that's at every level, undergraduate, graduate, postdoc, and the professors here have been committed to these challenges for a long time and therefore are going to have a big impact. So I love the grand challenges, but you should look around and look what already is happening. And I'm going to talk specifically about what needs to happen because we made a strategic decision at the engine two years ago to really double down on the companies that we'd already backed to help get them to scale. Because it's really nice to invent. It makes everybody feel good. But to get them to climate scale, as, as Arthi was saying, is the most important thing. And that will take every board meeting that I've gone to in the last six months where we've proven the technology and we're beginning to scale it. What you are seeing around these boardrooms are, whoa, there is so much commercial potential. We are having our doors beaten down by companies that want to buy the technology, partner with us, we are going to have to move at the scale of what happened during World War II. And how do we do that? Now, in some ways, that's terrifying from where I sit. And in other ways, it's the most <coughs> exciting moment because you have these groups of people, often lots of young people, <coughs> like this whole next generation, who are devoting their careers to this. But they're going to learn how to manufacture quickly. They're going to learn how to reinvent supply chains and, and put teams together that can work collaboratively. Those are the kinds of things that we're working on right now. And I think these next challenges that are being put together are extremely exciting. But let's not also look uh, over what's already happening here in, in this great region and around the world. So that's my privilege. Uh, at MathWorks, um, we don't work on, we don't develop physical products that are going to solve climate change them, to themselves. However, we do make software tools that are widely used among engineering and science. So I thought I would maybe talk somewhat about my, our customers and what we see going on out there in engineering and science. Um, among the larger, more established companies, um, they're shifting wholesale their, their teams um, onto um, uh, things like electrification. You know, the automotive industry has just moved their engineers from internal combustion engines over to, uh, over to the electrification type projects. And that's on a large scale. And uh, it's pretty exciting what's going on there and how much is happening. So we're, we're seeing kind of that throughout, throughout engineering. Uh, and so the large companies can do that. They, they can scale up rapidly by shifting resources and shifting hiring. And, that, and that's happening right now and, and can really accommodate new, new advances in technology that come along and really scale them out pretty quickly. Um, you know, there are great stories of that. You know, uh, just, if you just look at the time constant of some well-known things, you know, the, um, it was just 10 years ago that the first LEAF was sold commercially as a, the first electric vehicle, uh, uh, Nissan LEAF, and now the, the electric vehicles are very widely available. That's amazing. That's just 10 years, okay. Um, the, um, you know, right, uh, well, the crossing point was batteries. Batteries reached a point where suddenly, uh, you, could, you know, the leaf had a range of 70 miles, and, and then there was a jump in range to around 300 miles, and that made all the difference. And now it's highly competitive, and, and is, you know, it, it's a happening thing there. So there's, uh, you know, in terms of other, uh, there's other great scale-ups that large companies have, have done. Um, you know, Apple, you know, 15 years ago, the iPhone was introduced. 15 years later, you know, virtually every human on the planet has got an iPhone. That's extraordinary in human history, okay? Um, and uh, that's another example. And then my favorite scale-up of all time, of course, is the COVID vaccines. That's 18 months to get, to get that out. So, so industry can do these things, uh, especially when there's an economic incentive, as Secretary Kerry said. Uh, so that's the big companies. On the smaller companies, um, we've seen a real explosion in startups in the last several years. Uh, it's really, it's really kind, of, kind of breathtaking. I mean, I have, I, you know, we looked, I looked in some of our databases. You know, we have, there's over 4,000 startups uh, that I found using our tools. Um, and they use them for um, modeling and rapid prototyping. Um, of these, there are 750 that are relevant to climate change. There's 223 in electric vehicles, 142 in energy storage, 47 in solar, uh, 37 in wind. And, and kind of the secret sauce that unites these companies is uh, modeling and simulation. That's what they're all after, okay? And this is, one, this is the way that they get scale. They get scale by, 
you know, as, as we sometimes say, doing more in the computer than in the lab and doing more in the, in the lab than, than in the field. You know, sometimes people call this a shift left, okay? Um, and, um, and so the, the sort of modeling and simulation is really, is really a big deal right now and an important part of trying to um, uh, scale up early. Um, you know, a small team can do, when they model it and do it that way, can do a lot more than a, a big team doing everything by hand or doing everything, you know, just in the lab. So that's, a, that's one of the bigger scale up me methodologies that we've seen among, among the smaller companies there. Uh, so I, those are my thoughts. Yeah. So those are four very, you know, clear examples of, of real world progress and, and approaches that are that are being driven. But um, as as we know from the conversation today, and you you uh, really nailed this, Manish, that we're not on track, right? We we have a big gap that we've got across. So obviously we need all hands on deck. And so I wanted to pivot maybe to talk about some of the players and and how you know this room and uh, those uh, outside this room contribute to help do the work that your organizations are doing. And maybe we'll start with entrepreneurs since we're at MIT, and I know we have a lot of entrepreneurs in this audience and listening to uh, uh, the webcast as well. So um, what's, you know, they're looking at uh, uh, an opportunity, but they've got a long way to go. What's, what's the advice that you have for, for entrepreneurs, how to get from here to there? Maybe I'll put it right back to you, Jack, and then, and then Katie, if you could jump in, that'd be great too. Well, I thought of lots of ways I could go on this, but I'm going to go to a really basic one. It's really hard to hire people right now, okay? It is. And you got to you got to focus on recruiting. I know this isn't really to climate change per se, but I'm just telling you, that's the shortage. There's so many good ideas, so many startups, okay? Um, and so talent is really rough. So, and to, recruiting is something you can get good at. You know, we have, we have people on our staff that are extraordinary and other people that aren't so good, and it's a big difference in terms of building a team. Uh, I, if you're a small company, I encourage you to uh, get a, to hire a recruiter, get a full-time recruiter, get some of those on your staff. It makes a big difference to have somebody coming in every day working on that. So, uh, so spend, spend, there are ways to do it. There, are, there, is tech, there is technology and processes and ways to do it that you can do, do better at that, uh, but you've got to focus on it putting people at the center. So, Katie, do you want to jump in? Yes, yeah, so I would say three things. Number one, I think everyone at MIT basically has the ability to pick a big area, understand how you would take technology and impact that area. So pick something huge, something gnarly, hard, but if you succeed, the impact will be huge. And I think our, in general, we are focused that way, but I think that's important. The second thing is, ha it, it does have to be do with recruitment. You have to believe that you are the one to solve it. It's, you're not looking to somebody else to lead. It is your job to lead and find people who want to lead with you. So who is that core team? And then the third is work your plan. You know, nothing, it, lots of big ideas out there, but the people who win actually build it. They work it, they test it, they find people to help them. So I always think, who are your natural allies that can help you build faster and really show progress? And when we look at ideas, we're looking for all three of those. A space big enough that we could have a huge company and a huge impact, and then a team that's committed to each other but that they actually show that they can do something. So that's, that's what I always focus on. Well, as somebody running, running a clean energy company, that advice really resonates. Thank you. Thank you both for, for focusing on that and, and um, I think challenging all of us to, to find the people that are going to work together to solve the challenge. Some of those people will also be uh, not in the private sector uh, as entrepreneurs, but in the public sector. Uh, we need public policy leaders and, you know, that's been obviously a theme of the conversation today from, from Secretary Kerry and you know, some of the remarks already on this panel. So maybe I'll, I'll go um, uh, to Arthi uh, and, and just say, you know, what would, what would be, and, and Manish as well, if, uh, if you could jump in, you know, what, what do we ask of our public leaders? What do we need the public sector and public, public policy leaders to do? Yeah, I thought Secretary Kerry really put his finger on it. it you know, we know we can get to full decarbonization across all of these different sectors. 
We know it's possible technically. The problem is we've never done it in the very few decades that are available. And now we have to do it across electricity, transportation, agriculture, industry, everything simultaneously. And, and it, it, absolutely the, trillion, the tens of trillions of dollars in the market need to get mobilized to go do this work. If left to do it at the pace at which profits can drive that process forward, we're simply not gonna make it in time. And so the, the two really significant roles of government are figuring out how to drive it faster forward, and that means removing barriers, it means putting incentives in place, it means reshaping markets, because that's how every other infrastructure got built, and now it has to get done on steroids. Number one, faster, and number two, equitably, because we know that the infrastructures that got built in the past have left us with, with exacerbated in, inequalities, and this has to get done in a way that's very different this time. And I'll just say on that issue that, of course, that is about the fact that we have to treat everyone in our society in the right way and, and elevate people, but it's also true that we're not gonna meet our decarbonization goals unless <laughs> How, do, how are we gonna de decarbonize passenger transport if we assume everyone's gonna charge at home but half of Americans can't charge at home? And how are we going to use uh, demand flexibility to deal with variability from renewables so that we can have decarbonized electricity if it's only people who put in a Nest thermostat and spend hours figuring out how to optimize it that are able to really make that contribution. So I think we've got some very significant roles that the public sector has to play and is, you know, fortunately, I think, is starting to really step up to. Go ahead, Manish. Yeah, no, working I mean, on this all day. The, um, the, the scale, the, the speed and scale of what needs to be done is, is, is mind boggling. You know, we're at 17%, we need to get to 50 to 52. That's basically 4% a year for the next eight years. That's roughly what happened in the pandemic, but without any of the costs. And we need to do that year after year. So the policy is gonna be critical. The window is short. The next six months, quite frankly, are make or break. We need to see at least two fundamental things come out of Washington to create the economic incentives to move the trillions. There's 320 billion in potential tax credits for the power sector, for vehicles, for homes, for appliances, that has to get across the finish line. That's gonna really stimulate the shift we need to see in the next few years. The second thing though, is we also need rules. We need regulation. We're not gonna be able to just create the carrots. We need to move kind of the fossil infrastructure out. So getting clean power plant standards and clean vehicle standards for the next generation of vehicles is gonna be absolutely critical. So those two things are critical. The other piece we need to see is continued ambition from states, from California, from Massachusetts, from progressive states, but we also need to see some purple and red states start to take steps. The only way to get to 50 to 52% is with policy interlocking with technology and finance. And all three of these, the clean energy tax credits, rules on power plants and vehicles, and greater state leadership is critical. And Manish, Ar Arthi raised a great point on, on equity, right? I mean, that's uh, been um, a lesser part of the public policy conversation, should we say. So how is NRDC and, and, bringing that? And this is absolutely, absolutely critical. Um, the, uh, so, so how we actually design these credits in a way that help address both that there are gonna be losers in the transition. We need to be, and what we can't say is we're gonna create X hundreds of thousands of renewable energy jobs and we might lose these jobs. Well, they may not be in the same place. They may not have the same skills. How do you think about that transition in a much, much more sophisticated way? And how do you actually deal with frontline communities, environmental justice issues that have been other, uh, uh, kind of really marginalized over the decades in a way? Fortunately, at least in the House passed Build Back Better Act, there was over 150 billion of environmental justice investments in addition to the tax credits. Those must be protected. So investments um, uh, in, at the billion dollar scale, uh, not only focused on equity, but obviously you know, across the board, that's a big part of the challenge. So we talked about entrepreneurs and policy makers. What, what's the role of uh, capital markets, of um, you know, ESG uh, investing has uh, really unlocked a, a pretty unique moment now where we do see a lot of capital finally flowing into this space after many years of not. So uh, what, what do we ask of then? And, um, 
you know, how do we make sure that those dollars, as large as they are, are, are ultimately limited given the size of the challenge? How do we put them to the highest and best use? Maybe, Katie, do you want to jump yeah, on Yeah, I that? mean, I think it is a really important time in, in larger capital markets. You know, you see all the big players committing billion, hundreds of billions of dollars to green technology. And I think what they're all looking to is what's the right technology to back. And they are not looking for concessionary dollars. They're looking to make a lot of money on this transition, which I think is good news for this transition because they're seeing the downside risk to all the assets they own if we don't make the transition. And they're, they're seeing that there are going to be outlier winners um, from these new technology companies, especially, um, or new processes, not just software, but the actual hard assets. And I was just in New York yesterday at a Bloomberg conference on this, and they were all there in droves. They all were looking at how are they going to put not, you know, 10 billion to work, but 100 billion or 500 billion dollars to work in these areas. And so I think it's incumbent upon the technologies that are starting to cross over to being able to scale to to get their stuff in order and raise that capital now because we have no time to waste. And so I think any of you that know these entrepreneurs, can support these entrepreneurs, can lend whatever hand in their uh, scaling as really leaders, they need that help. I mean, that's, that's really what's happening. These are leaders that have never grown a scaled company before. Like, think about our, our Commonwealth Fusion here out of MIT. Bob Mumgard is a PhD student, has learned to be an extraordinary CEO. He's got a lot to do to scale or Shreya DeVay scaling via separations. She's gonna decarbonize pulp and paper mills. They are huge polluters right now. And her task to scale that company globally will mean that all of us need to help there. And the capital markets are ready to back them. So let's get our entrepreneurs as much help as possible. <laughs> So we're, we're quite short on time. Does anybody want to jump in, though, for, for 10 or 30 seconds on, on this last point before we wrap up? Just go ahead, Manish. Go ahead, please, Manish. No, one, one very uh, absolutely agree with everything um, that was said. I, I, just bringing in kind of a little bit on the equity piece and on the resilience piece, the, also the need for public money. Some issues are just the private sector won't necessarily move in because there isn't money to be easily made. I think that's particularly true as we think about resilience, particularly resilience in the developing world. And that is an area where, quite frankly, the US government has fallen far short of where it needs to be. So just, just a strong, we also need to kind of, Earth Day's tomorrow, we need to get the kind of people out there and to actually demand the types of solutions and the type of commitment we need from this government, both for the United States, but also for the world. You're here, well said. Um, well, unfortunately, we are uh, at the end of our relatively short time here. So, um, but thank you all for sharing such incredibly um, positive and and optimistic stories about um, you know the work that lies ahead. And um, I know with uh, the resources uh, that are gathered in this room together, all working on this challenge, that you know it's a it's a good day to think about you know the the optimistic side of progress. So uh, please join me in thanking the panel for their comments. Thank you, Alicia and, and panel. My name is Richard Lester, and it, um, it's my job to bring bring things to a, a close. So, what we've heard, I, for me, three takeaways this morning. Um, first, we must deploy right away the clean energy technologies that we know we need. Second, we must lay the groundwork for the additional solutions that we know we're also going to need. And we must do this as fast as possible, too. And third, we need policies that are fair. In a, in a problem as complex as climate, there are obviously going to be winners and losers. But unless our policies embody the principle of fairness at the community level, 
at the national level, at the international level, we're not going to be successful. And let's not waste time arguing about which one of these three is most important. We need all of them. And every one of us, I took away, needs to put our shoulder to the wheel at the points where our leverage is maximized, where we can do what we're best at. And for MIT, Climate Grand Challenges is one of those maximum leverage points. Working with our students to apply forefront knowledge to solve hard problems is one of the things that MIT does best. Also, doing it in a way that brings together the natural sciences and engineering with the social sciences and the humanities. Because in the end, the solutions will be about how people of all kinds live and work. And so our research must also involve culture and politics and ethics, as well as science, technology, and policy, and economics, I should say. We, we heard some big ideas this morning, transforming agriculture and food, repowering huge industries, revolutionizing climate risk forecasting and climate adaptation. We'll see whether they can all be achieved, but we're sharing our plans now, today, before the results are known, for two reasons. To succeed, we need partners, entrepreneurs, financiers, philanthropists, companies, community leaders, policymakers, partners in the research and partners in developing the products and services and pathways to scale in time to make a difference. And so the first message is to prospective partners. We need your know-how. We need your resources. Please join us. And the second message is to other people like us. The climate challenge requires a commitment of every research institution with the relevant skills and creativity, and there are many. So the second message to our colleagues around the world is please consider doing something similar if you haven't already. And if we can help you, we will. And last, and most important, I just want to thank everyone who's involved in this. The hundreds, literally hundreds, of faculty and staff and students at MIT who've been participating in Climate Grand Challenges, the many non-MIT colleagues who've helped us, our panelists this morning, and everyone who's here in person or watching on the live stream. I also want to thank Mr. Mac McQuown of Sonoma, California, whose generosity has made this initiative possible. To everyone who's here, still here, before you leave, uh, please have a look at the display over in Salon West that highlights all 27 of the Climate Grand Challenge finalist projects. Many of these others are also exceptionally promising. And beyond these, of course, there's a great deal of important climate-related research already in progress across the campus. So please stay tuned. Much more to come. As Rafael might have said, if he wasn't from Venezuela, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.